Let me ask you, have you as a solo person ended up feeling left out, unheard, misunderstood, overlooked, and even disposable in your relationships with folks who have a nesting or primary partner or who are married? Have you wondered if it's even possible for someone to prioritize you when they're living with someone else? As solo relationship anarchists, and solo polyamorists, we often find ourselves with a double burden. We need both to communicate what we want in our relationships and also establish the ways that, while negotiating from a solo perspective can provide us with a lot of power and freedom, it also often leads others to assume we're not serious or committed in our relationships. It takes a lot of skill to negotiate successful cooperative agreements, and living solo can make that even more complicated. Hi, I'm Nancy Chanteau, and I'm here to share with you about how we can use cooperative communication to negotiate agreements that support our solo lifestyle, help others understand us better, and invite them to treat us in ways that work for us. If you can see and hear me, please post in the comments and let me know. Uh, I'm going to wait until I get confirmation to get started. I'm just going to go and check and make sure I can see on the page that we're broadcasting live. Yep, there we are. So um, as long as you can hear me, we're good to go. Um, if you let me know that. Uh, and if you are watching this later, please type replay in the comments. I'll be putting y'all's comments on the screen during this broadcast. So if you prefer I don't do that, let me know that too. And hey, Eileen, yay, thanks. I'm glad you can see me and hear me. Okay, let's get started. Here are the questions we began with. Have you as a solo person ended up feeling left out, unheard, misunderstood, overlooked, and disposable in the, your relationships with folks who have a nesting or primary relationship or who are married? Have you wondered if it's even possible for someone to prioritize you when they're living with someone else? First, let's explore what I mean by a cooperative agreement. Cooperation occurs between two or more autonomous parties who are capable of saying yes and no and enacting their boundaries. Using the definition from the Radical Therapy Collective, we enact cooperation by asking for 100% of what we want and negotiating to agreement. This means we don't power play each other. Examples of power plays can include keeping secrets, telling lies, rescuing by doing more than our share or more than we want to do, and full on power plays where we make people do something they don't want to do or keep them from doing what they want to do. We can also end up doing withhold power plays where we withhold our energy, effort, or attention. We can make agreements about all kinds of topics and complexities. I've helped people navigate, negotiate everything from their polycule sleeping arrangements in a shared household or parenting time and standards for child rearing to how many movies to watch each week and whether to replace the trash compactor liner before or after they take the trash out to the curb. What I've learned is that even the smallest thing can be very emotional to someone. In the trash compactor example, one of the parties drew a line in the sand. They said, how I want something needs to be as important to you as how you want something. And this is something that means a lot to me. I give in a lot and I'm not giving in on this. One of the hard things about being solo and also negotiating complex topics with loved ones is that we're allocating precious time with them and our time might not be extensive. Be gentle with yourself if you find that your topic will take up all the time that you have available to relate. It's okay to wait or break something up into smaller units. And it also might require both parties to commit some extra relating time to a complicated negotiation. Cooperation takes time, as does intimacy. And as much as we would like to be able to rush it, we often need the spaciousness and trust that comes with a sense of time abundance. Before we begin no negotiating agreements, it helps to start by creating our 100% statement. It's extremely useful to write this down on paper. There's an art to asking for 100% of what we want. First off, we might've been trained by the culture or our family of origin or um, to either not know what we want or not voice what we want. If we don't know, it's a process to learn what we want, how to identify it, and how to articulate it to others. If we need to learn to use our voice, we must practice asking with confidence and clarity for 100% of what we want. I was helping someone work on identifying what she wanted, and she said she knows what she wants for other people, but often leaves herself out. And then when she finally asks for what she wants, she speaks with an energy of demand and desperation because she's been in scarcity for so long. I invited her to write down answers to the following questions. One, what do I want for others when they're on their own? What do I want for myself when I'm on my own too? Three, what do I want for others when we're together? Four, what do I want for myself when I am with others? Five, what do I want for all of us? 
And six, where am I on the depletion repletion scale? And do I have the energy to do what I want? Sometimes we want many things, some of which are contradictory. In these cases, people will often try to eliminate one of their needs for clarity. I encourage people not to do this as our contradictory needs are often informative and can explain why we have a hard time being satisfied by any one thing. When we share all our needs, when we have multiple con contradictory or competing needs, I call that a compound 100% statement. Sometimes the other person will have a good idea for how we can fulfill all our needs. Sometimes the compound 100% statement will help us understand why satisfaction has been elusive and help us design a solution that meets some of our needs at one time and the other needs at another. Or if some of our needs are unmeetable, we may accept the unacceptable and soothe ourselves because our needs can't be met. A lot of the time when we're relating, we're beginning from a place of somewhere else than a lot of the normative relationship structures. Like we might really value our community connections or we might really value our solo time. And um, one of the big problems that people have is that uh, our, our relationship structure, um, the, the expected norm is that the people who are partnered are entitled to each other's time. So even just dismantling the sense of time entitlement can be a big process because it's, it's kind of like the water we're swimming in. It's an assumption that everybody who is operating from that norm makes that everyone should be making. And when we try and bust up that presumption, like, no, my time is actually mine and whether or not I share it isn't, um, that's my choice. It's not something that's up for negotiation necessarily because it's my time and then I can share it with whom I want versus um, if we're in the same space, you automatically get to have my time um, whenever you want it. That kind of uh, shift in perspective is a lot of the thing that's going on when we're relating from a solo perspective. We have a very different starting point for how we're relating with people and being able to um, communicate that kind of starting point is one of the things that we need to be good at in order to relate with people who are operating from normative standards. And even people who are trying to operate from non-normative standards can still end up um, stuck in internalized uh, assumptions and norms. Even I've noticed for myself, I, I often will assume that other people think the norm, even um, if we haven't talked about it yet because I'm used to operating in relationship with the norm. And that kind of assumption can end up creating crunchy dynamics as well. So a big part of this process is that when we're creating non-normative and alternative relationship structures, we're often having to um, check our work across the board. Like, what do, what do we mean by this? What is it that we're up to? What would be great for, for us in terms of relating? Um, do we want you know a default frequency or do we want a lot of freedom in how we relate and what happens when our needs are contradictory how do we handle that and um our prioritizations going to be automatically uh, defaulting to whatever is easiest for us because the entanglements in people's lives can end up having a lot more weight than people who are unentangled um demand you know because we're we're trying to protect those entanglements or other people are trying to protect those entanglements if we don't have them. Um, so uh, one of the things with our 100% statement that also is important, people often forget to include their met needs in a 100% statement. So an 100% statement full of unmet needs might get addressed with creative problem solving, yet disrupt the met needs that we already have taken care of. Um, and those changes might turn out to be unsustainable um, when people, that kind of thing can happen, people can end up feeling a little heartbroken because they've just done all this work to meet an, a stated unmet need and yet um, are unable to continue to do that because other needs become very, very important when they're disrupted. So I like to make sure people put um, their, like, what are all the things that I'm getting? What are all the things that are working? And what do I need to do? How much labor is it taking to do that? Maybe there's no room for any of these unmet needs, even though they're the pain points. Sometimes people hesitate to ask for 100% of what they want because they're afraid of the other person's reaction. I was just talking the other day with someone who really wanted to be witnessed in their desire to explore their sexuality by sharing some of their kinks. 
They knew their partner might want, not want to explore their kinks or even hear about them. And that it might be difficult for their partner to understand that even just witnessing their desire might, uh, might support more intimacy and connection. They just really wanted to be heard. They wanted to be able to speak about what it is that they wanted for themselves, regardless of what was happening between them and their partner. Even when we're facing a direct contradiction in wants, honoring someone's differences can really build trust and it can feel like support and care. You know, we can just say, I hear that you want that. And, um, you know, I really want you to be able to have what you want. And then I can also fit in, sit, sit in my own desires and notice that we don't have crossover in that. We don't have a complementary 100% around the, what you want to do. So I'm not necessarily going to be involved in you doing that. And I can feel those emotions too. And then we can both witness each other. Um, that move of actually making space versus immediately reacting to what someone wants as if it's a demand, um, that actually is a skill that we can build. So once everyone's written their 100%, we can share them with each other and begin analysis and negotiation. So we're going to start once we have both 100% statements from people. And, you know, if 100% is alienating to somebody, you can just say, write down what you want, you know, especially if we might make a list of the domains that we're interested in covering. Um, so once we've prepared a 100% statement, the other person has theirs. Um, what we're going to do is listen without responding first. So just acknowledge this other person has put energy into saying what they want. And we can acknowledge what it is that they want as long as we have enough space inside of ourselves to hear it. So um, oftentimes I'll write everything down if I'm in a mediation space. Um, and it's also, if you're doing this solo, it's good to have it um, available so that everybody can look at it together. When I'm listening to somebody, one of the things I'll do for myself is to take notes because that helps me process the information a little bit better. After hearing each other's 100%, um, it's great to acknowledge each other, give appreciations for doing the work. And um, as a practitioner, I often will want to make sure they've gone far enough because often what people will do if we're uncomfortable with what we want, um, we know that it's not going to be popular with the other person or that there's going to be a contradiction in needs. Sometimes people will pull back and only ask for what they think they can get. And um, that's kind of like doing an internal negotiation ahead of time. And asking for the compromise instead of asking for the full 100%. And there's a lot of problems with that because it can set us up to get um, negotiated down to something that's really way too far away from what we want. So we try to reflect and make sure that what we are asking for is really um, achieving, you know, I would be satisfied if I got this. And then after this moment of pausing and reflecting, we want to consider the different 100% statements and notice for notice anything that's in common. So what are the things that we both want? Um, and just going through that list and actually being able to say, look at all of the things we have in common. This is really potent. Here's a bunch of stuff. You know, hopefully there's a bunch of stuff. Oftentimes, if we're talking about, you know, wanting to feel connected, wanting to feel cared for and caring, um, wanting to feel heard and understood. These are things that, you know, are often something everyone wants. Um, and then once we have all of the commonalities, then we can take a look at the differences and acknowledge those. Like, oh, we have some really significant differences here. There's, these are contradiction, you know, these are um, differences in our needs or they're extremely, they're contradictory needs where we both can't get what we want at the same time. And under those circumstances, um, you know, if there's a, a significant difference in needs, then and people have been fighting over that topic, that is actually, you know, they they have a good reason for fighting. So sometimes it can be really helpful just to go, you know, it makes sense that we've been having a battle over this. Um, when there's a lot in common, sometimes people are fighting because they're having difficulty embodying commitments and. The, so the commitment, the, uh, the desire is the same, but the actual follow through isn't there. So sometimes when people are fighting, it's not because they have differences in needs. It's actually because somebody is having trouble following through. Or their ideas about what it means to do that, you know, to embody that commitment are different. So sometimes it, there's going to be something on a list that is on my list, but not on your list, for example. And I call those gaps 
where I've mentioned something or one person has mentioned something and the other person hasn't mentioned that thing. And with gaps, what you want to do is you want to check it out and find out whether or not a gap is actually a commonality or a difference. If you can do that, then you can, um, you can come to agreement around it as a commonality or rec you know, acknowledge that as a difference. And, you know, the person might say, I hadn't thought about that, but I'm totally willing to do that. Or I hadn't thought about that and I'm gonna have to think about it. Um, so it might be something that the other person needs some time to sit with if they haven't thought about it before. For example, if someone wants to check, have a check-in conversation once a week and the other person doesn't know, didn't mention check-in conversations at all, um, the person who wants who who hasn't thought of it might have to go look at their calendar and think about where it would fit and what it would mean to actually commit to a weekly check-in conversation and you know would they want that to be more spontaneous or like you know just know somebody is going to reach out during the week and if they miss it it's okay or is that something that they want to schedule so and what you know if somebody has multiple um, intimate relationships how many check-in conversations are they having in a week you know that might actually not work for everyone to spend a bunch of their time on the phone checking in so um differences are items that are directly opposed such as one person wanting to live together and the other person wanting to live separately um or one person wanting to share holidays together and the other person wanting solo time with the gaps we need to determine um Actually, I think I covered that. I'm going to pass on that. Um, so negotiating across different needs is one of the most advanced practices of cooperative communication. Co uh, cooperative conversations require us to locate ourselves in our wise adult consciousness. Our, that's our observing consciousness that helps us um, acknowledge uh, what is, acknowledge the events and the, tr the observable facts around us as they are. Um, to put aside our agenda for the moment and think creatively about the situation. And I'm gonna talk about some ways that we can do that, um, how we know how to do that in Skills for Change. Without resorting to lowest, com I call compromise lowest common denominator solutions. And oftentimes what happens with lowest common denominator solutions is that people, um, everybody feels like the other person is winning and nobody feels like they're winning. And so we really just wanna avoid those as much as possible. So creating a win-win in negotiations is a really, you know, famous strategy uh, for solving intractable problems. And it means that everybody, we're trying to figure out how everybody can get at, um, what they want and that perhaps we're going to get what we want by getting, by helping the other person get what they want. So um, one of our common cultural beliefs is that there's always a win-win and that is definitely an idealism that can get us in trouble. Because if we haven't found a solution yet, we can end up blaming ourselves or pressuring ourselves to find a solution, but maybe there isn't one. And if there isn't a solution, maybe we're better off accepting that there isn't a solution and starting to figure out our, you know, what are we going to do in the absence of a solution versus trying to um, pressure uh, ourselves and each other to find one. Sometimes we're lucky and there is a win-win solution. And often when people are, are struggling and fighting, the reason they haven't found a win-win solution is that there isn't one. Um, if, they, if there was one, they would have found it already. The other big idealism that can get us in trouble in, um, is that compromises are good solutions. I've talked about this. I just talked about this. Um, we take what little in common people have and create an agreement where everyone gets that little bit of what's in common between them and then expect people to be happy with that outcome um, because the other person isn't getting what they want either. And I just, I think that's actually a huge waste of time and energy because nobody feels good. Compromises in a word suck. Everyone's miserable, no one's getting enough of what they want and everyone feels like the other person is winning and they're losing. When this happens, people start competing to not lose and that's when things start getting vicious. What I look for when I'm helping people negotiate solutions to their intractable problems are win-lose solutions. So those are solutions where one person can win and the other person is losing because if we can get enough win-loses stacked in order, everybody actually has a feeling of winning at, a t at one time. So today I win, tomorrow you win, and we all know that I'm going to get to win soon. 
and and that then I can enjoy your win when you're having it and you can enjoy my win when I'm having it and we're getting as much of what we want as possible. Um, that's actually what we're really, that's gonna get us much closer to our 100%. Um, so if we don't have a shared commonality, if we have differences, if we can um, you know, not do all of them all at the same time, but actually sequence them, that is a super helpful way to get everybody more of what they want. So in, I did this once in a relationship where um, if something wasn't super critical to either of us, um, we just assigned even and odd days to each other. So when we were hanging out, if it was an even day, I would win. If it was an odd day, he would win. And um, we would go for hikes in the redwoods and eat Asian food one day because that's what I liked. And on odd days, we went and saw movies and ate takeout from the food trucks. And that kind of balance where we both knew that there was, you know, our turn was coming, um, totally worked on things that weren't essential. I like to help people find a decision-making strategy that can produce that kind of balance, you know, if it doesn't matter, when it doesn't matter. Um, in situations where one person wants to share themselves with, with other sexual partners and another person wants sexually exclusive relationships, win-lose sol uh, solutions don't work. So we can't trade off needs because the needs are incompatible with each other, which is what I mean by having contradictory competing needs. Um, and, you know, people arguing over solo time can be like that, like um, somebody saying, well, you know, I really need your time and attention. And the other person's like, well, so do I, <laughs> you know, I need my time and attention. Um, my time and attention is a scarce resource for me. And I, you know, I'm going to need to, even though it seems like I'm available, I'm not. That would be also an example of a solo contradictory competing need. Um, it's not to say that we should let someone have what they want when it goes against our needs just because they can win and we can't. If we're both committed to the relationship, um, why not let someone win if the consequences aren't too dire? We can always trade their win now for a future win on our part later or for lots of appreciation for allowing them to get what they wanted when there wasn't a win available for both of us. But that's only when the, um, the topic is not you know, on that really high intensity scale. One of the tragedies of relationships is when we end up in a situation where we start competing to not lose. Um, when we have this perception the other person is going to win and if um, they're going to win, we're going to lose. Um, yet, oftentimes when I ask if the other person thinks they're winning, they don't. So competing to not lose is um, really insidious because we're no longer trying to win. Um, there isn't a win in sight and we just don't want to lose. And this can end up being like a um, Z said, they said kind of fight, right? The antidote to this type of battle is to return to our 100%. What do we each want? Is what we want possible given our circumstances and resources? If not, is something we want possible even if it's not our 100%? When we can't figure out common ground, we might be facing a circumstance where we have to choose the least worst rescue or the least awful of our series of bad choices. When this is what's happening, we might be distracting ourselves with the delusion that someone else is getting what they want while we're not. And this is a key moment where we have the opportunity to practice accepting the unacceptable. And when I say accepting the unacceptable, that doesn't mean that we're going to go into resignation around it. it what it means is that we're saying, okay, this is what's actually happening. So now I'm going to take a breath and just feel that. And from there, I get to figure out what I want, what is acceptable and not acceptable to me, and what my options are. And then I get to choose my response. Um, if we keep banging our head against the wall of what is and not accepting it, oftentimes we don't have the energy to make that next choice move. And that can be really critical for us to be successful, that we have enough energy to try the next thing. So let's talk about making agreements, and then I'll wrap this up and, and open up to questions. Um, with values and preferences in common, I ask people what their confidence in the outcome turning out as they've said they want. If they're highly confident, we might not need to write down agreements or document them or do anything like that. When there's low confidence, there might be um, reasons why. So somebody might need to learn or um, embody a new skill. Um, we might have to make agreements for the learning process and document what we've discussed and how long it will take for that to actually come into form. And I like to use online documents if I'm going to actually write an agreement down because it's easy for everyone to share access. Um, I've had 
clients or students use binders where they, you know, everybody knew where the binder was. Um, I have people create notebooks where they wrote down what their agreements were in a notebook where they um, could put their hands on it really easily and everybody had their own copy or to make a document and then, you know, make copies for everyone. Um, one of the big differences that seems to come up with solo folks is having equal access to holidays and vacation time. There can be a lot of assumptions and entitlement around who gets to spend key holidays together or even who gets to go on vacations, especially when someone has limited time off. Scarcity is one of the things that makes cooperation more challenging. And we'll often see people, um, the big power play that happens when there's scarcity is rescue, where people do more than their share or more than they want to do in an attempt to try and fix things. So we're really looking at how um, when there's a scarce resource and a lot of demand on that scarce resource, how do we allocate it in a way that feels good? First to the person who is in possession of it, especially if, I mean, I know for myself, if I feel like I'm the scarce resource, I start getting really itchy. <laughs> That's not good a good feeling for me as a solo person. So I don't want people pulling me apart, right? Like I don't want to feel like there's competition for my attention. Um, so here's some, some things we could do. May, we can make a list of all the contested holidays and vacations and we can try and split time evenly. That might end up being a least a lowest common denominator solution or a compromise solution. And everybody might be miserable if we are always splitting up the time. Um, sometimes we can share. So everybody can go on, you know, come to the holiday or go on the vacation, maybe even spending parallel time on the vacation. So, um, People are going back and forth, you know, between hotel rooms or different, you know, um, spaces if, if they're in close proximity. Um, so, you know, like we are parallel at home. Why not be parallel on vacation? Everybody gets to have a great time, have solo time and have together time. Uh, we might agree to give everyone first dibs on an event or vacation so they get their 100% each year at least once. Or maybe make a trade-off plan where one year someone gets key holidays and the next year key vacations and vice versa. Um, as solo people, we really just want to remind ourselves that if you want a vacation alone or prefer not to share holidays, that's okay too. You know, you are on the list of people who are getting served here. And here are some tips for making agreements. When we're unhappy with how things are going, it can be really helpful to start with an assumption of positive intent and some curiosity. What's 100% of what each person wants and how do they want to feel in between communication? It's easier to find common ground when we start with something some, with what someone wants versus starting with a complaint. For example, when talking about communication frequency, people often want really different levels of contact. If we can describe our minimum and maximum wants and our limits, perhaps there's a way to supplement daily contact with something like durable expressions of care, like writing a letter of appreciation or making a video or an audio recording that can be read or experienced over and over again. Sometimes we can trade off win loses. Um, one person likes sex in the morning, another person likes sex in the middle of the night. Is it possible for everyone to get their way by trading off win loses? Um, today we have sex in the morning, next time we have sex in the middle of the night, as long as it's a weekend. Um, or creating a decision-making process that feels more fair. Instead of one person always giving in to what the other person wants, we might have a reasonable way of deciding competing needs like rock, paper, scissors, flipping a coin, odd days, even days. Um, any of those decision-making methods are pretty balanced and um, can you know end up in a pretty even distribution of decisions for and against. Or you could even like flip a coin once and then the next time the other person gets their way, that kind of trade-off. As long as the decision isn't high stakes, this kind of decision-making distribution can work great. Remember, cooperative agreements aren't rules. If someone doesn't follow an agreement they made, clear your health feeling about it and ask to hear why they didn't keep the agreement. In my experience, these kinds of moments are opportunities to clarify what an agreement means to us and what the person can and can't commit to. Sometimes it's simply a matter of recommitting to keeping the agreement in future, and sometimes a person has a radically different interpretation of what the agreement meant. Agreements exist to help us move in integrity with our care and commitments with each other. If we can't keep an agreement and end up breaking trust, we might need to return to our 100% statements and notice if we are being honest with ourselves about what we need and want. And if you're the person with whom agreements are being made and not kept, ask yourself if you're willing to continue relating with someone who is unreliable in their agreement making. Perhaps you're trying to get what you want and the other person isn't going along to make you happy, or the person is going along to make you happy but isn't really participating in the agreement itself. What's your boundary? How much space do you need to put in, 
into the relationship if your agreement's not kept and move your body away from that. So um, I know this was a long talk on my part, but I'd love to hear back from you. Um, have you done some successful solo negotiations and how does that feel when you work that through? Um, and also what happens when it doesn't work out? What, what are the kinds of problems that show up? Go and put that in the chat. Um, and if those two questions aren't relevant to you, um, are you accustomed to asking for your 100%? Have you done a lot of that before? And how how is it for you to make space for the 100% of others? So I don't just want to help people learn to communicate cooperatively. I'm also interested in helping people develop a career that's aligned with your values. Um, and right now, the doors are open for the summer session of the Cooperative Communication Practitioner Certification Program. It's 14 weeks where we'll help people speak their truth, listen with compassion, and negotiate cooperative agreements, just like I talked about today, to get more of what we want in our relationships. We're starting on June 12th, 2022, and um, there's going to be a bonus call with me on, 20, um, on June 11th, that's a Saturday, where you'll get to experience a future mapping guided process with me um, about cooperative communication and how you want to bring it to your community. Vision isn't just a mental exercise, it's something we can feel. And um, doing processes like this, even in our um, relationships, can really help us guide through the felt sense towards our future that we want and not just our ideas. I'm going to put some links in the chat. Um, I have the list of questions I asked earlier written down in a post. And um, if you have any you know, situations you've tried to negotiate that haven't worked out that you would like some feedback on or um, questions about uh, you know, what we can do about situations where um, somebody's not making enough time to negotiate with us when we're solo, you know, they're, they're devaluing the relationship because um, they don't think it's important to us or their, you know, relationships are only important when people are entangled. Um, share your story and we'll talk about it and see if there's anything we can come up with together. And um, thanks for joining me. I'm excited that I got to talk about this subject today with you and uh, I'm thrilled that you came and participated. So I'm going to put those links. All right. Here's the one with the questions. And then one of the questions somebody asked yesterday was about, you know, what happens when people start getting really resistant to having conversations about things that are part of, you know, relationship anarchy culture or part of um, how we think about non-hierarchy or something like that. And I just uh, really like to practice taking the jargon out when it's, whenever it's possible to do that, because the jargon can end up feeling like, oh, I, you know, something that I don't know. I'm supposed to have to learn about that thing in order to even talk about it. Um, and, you know, jargon is can be empowering because it can teach us something about a process that we didn't understand. And if we can then revert back to common language, um, it can make it feel like we're more on a level playing field so that um, there isn't an education burden for somebody to understand the topic that we're having. Um, I also, I see people a lot um, getting defensive when they're hearing about somebody wanting something that they either feel like they can't do or that would require a change from them. And um, in my experience, when somebody is in that state, oftentimes it's going to get hard. It's going to be hard to get what, what we want from that conversation. Um, so, so oftentimes it can be good to just take a break. And then, and then have everyone write down what they want and share their 100% again before we go back into trying to explain differences. Um, if somebody is consistently getting defensive, one of the, the conversations that can be really useful to have is, you know, if we have this difference, if there's feedback that needs to be given across our relating dynamic, um, 
and that feedback doesn't get given and the result is that space is going to get taken um what's the best way to give that feedback you know what's how does somebody receive feedback well and um what it, you know what will help them listen and as much as possible i like to try and write things out so that i can take away all of the kind of feelings of powerlessness that I have that are making me feel crunchy um, so that it makes the other person, makes it easier for the other person to listen to what I have to say. And then I try and read it off the paper and not add all of my snarky comments. <laughs> so um, hopefully this was a useful talk to you. I'm uh, not seeing any questions or comments in the chat, but if you have them, go ahead and, and you're watching this replay, go ahead and put it in the chat and I'll keep um, responding on this uh, thread after the call is over. Um, I really appreciate y'all for coming and watching and, um, you know, solo, keep going with your, your bad solo self. That's what I have to say. Oh, I see a comment from Caroline. Um, I'll start out stating my 100%, then walk it back as my partner's stalemate resists sharing their own desires. Yeah, I actually, I I was related with somebody who wouldn't share what their 100% was. And um, so I got, I did a vision process where I walked us through a guided practice um, of imagining, you know, some amount of time into the future. And then I wrote down what they said when they were sharing their image of what the future would look like and read it back to them. And I said, Is that kind of what you want? from your relationships and, and and then I was able to, you know, put my next to it. Um, I often find that when people are um, resisting something or uh, challenging a process, it's because they don't want, they don't want change. Like maybe they're getting more of what they want than you are. And if that's happening, they're successfully strategizing to get their 100% and to keep you from having yours because they're afraid that you getting what you want will stop them from having what they want. And, um, you know, that's not great. Uh, it might not be about you. It might be about past experiences where somebody would use what they wanted against them. And it's just a matter of how much work are you willing to do to support them? You know, it's kind of sad when People are so afraid of losing what they have that they won't open up to the possibility that there could be something better. Um, you know, people get hurt and they start defending their hearts. And um, sometimes it takes a while before they will, you know, make that shift. Especially if um, the change is actually being couched as. Uh, you know, something that is against what they want. I have a, I'm in, you know, I've been having a long-term negotiation with someone where, you know, we really have different needs around scheduling and, um, you know, they're, I feel like they're very contradictory needs. And even just being able to say like, we don't want the same things can, can be very difficult for this person. So I, get that you know i understand if we don't want the same things where does that leave us are we going to walk away from each other or are you know is one person going to keep on giving up what they want in order for the relationship to continue and and what does that do to the overall quality of the dynamic if one person is continually hurt or suffering or struggling um, because they're in scarcity of their needs getting met and the you know alternative is to accept that there isn't enough crossover you know like i always like to think about a venn diagram is there enough crossover in our 100 percents for us to actually relate and the answer might not always be yes and you know that's just what is uh, especially if we have attachments around it you know it it can feel like we're being abandoned when in reality there just isn't enough of what we want to work with which sometimes we just need to grieve and you know let go um, and sometimes wait and take a break and find out whether or not a change of season or a change of um, qualities between us makes relating more exciting and connective again, you know.
we've been through a lot together as a culture and as people um, in the last few years. And I'm, my sense of it is that the nurturers, people who are givers have really gotten heavily burnt. And it's interesting to see how things fall apart when those folks aren't actually doing all of that extra labor around nurturance. And also that, um, you know, our culture really isn't valuing the nurturance enough for everyone to be learning to do it or boosting the resources and support the nurturers are getting. It's almost like the nurturers have to get back to being good enough to nurture themselves because they're the ones who know what they need, <laughs> which is kind of horrible, right? <laughs> um, anyways, yeah, so uh, when we're in stalemates around what we want, one of the things that I really like to do is say it out loud you know, to say, you know, you want this, I want this, it's a contradictory competing need. We can't both get what we want at the same time. And I feel really sad about that. I would love it if we could get what we wanted together. And I don't, I don't know what to do. I need help. You know, something so simple um, can really, even just accepting it together can feel a little bit more connective. Thanks for your comment, Caroline. I hope that was, I don't know, you know, it's not necessarily helpful, but it is real, right? Um, to deal with that sadness. Okay. Uh, I'm going to have to get out of here soon, but um, I have really enjoyed doing this series with you all. And um, I, like I said, I appreciate your comments and feedback. If there's anything else you'd like to hear about from me, I'll do, I'm going to be doing series like this, I think maybe a little bit more often now that I figured out how to have high speed internet. <laughs> um, so that is great. It's not super fuzzy in the replay. All right. Um, have a wonderful night or day or wherever you are and uh, be well. <laughs>